Uh, State of Ohio, again, Mr. Stanley Ford, Mr. Ford's present, represented by counsel, Mr. Gorman and Mr. Riley. On behalf of the State of Ohio, are Mr. LaPrinzi and Mr. Uh, D'Angelo. Um, today is Tuesday, September 14th. Um, we are prepared to proceed with the state's uh, ongoing case. Uh, for the record, um, there are currently two uh, orders out of in Summit County. One is by the Summit County Executive regarding uh, masks in all um, areas of the uh, any county building, and the Summit County uh, Administrative Order that requires masks to be worn at all times while in the courthouse, including during jury trials. In my courtroom, uh, the 12 jurors in the uh, jury box are separated by plexiglass between them plexiglass in front of them. The gallery is separated by plexiglass and in the gallery is a um, fully masked camera person. We have a still photographer that comes in on occasion. That person is fully masked and then the five, al four alternates, four of the five alternates, excuse me, are seated in the um, gallery. There are no spectators at this time that in that they are in an overflow courtroom. They have been, that has been available to them the entire time we've been in trial. Um, my courtroom is open, but due to the spacing requirements and the limited areas we have in here, we provided the extra uh, courtroom for video and viewing of the trial as it's happening live. The attorneys are, and deputies and court reporter and myself are all masked during the um, entire entirety of the trial except with the with the following exceptions the attorneys are permitted to remove their masks when speaking either um, questioning opening and closing arguments um, the witnesses enter the courtroom with masks on they're sworn they're seated and then upon the start of their testimony they remove their masks so that um, the attorneys can effectively direct and cross-examine those witnesses have I adequately laid out our procedures that we have been following to date, Mr. McKenzie? Yes, Your Honor. That is Ms. an accurate recitation. Mr. Borman? That's true, Judge, yes. Okay. All right. Mr. Ford, um, good morning. Good morning. You know you have a right not to wear a mask. If you don't want to wear a mask and you want to wear a clear face shield, the court would provide you with one of those, or you can continue to wear the white cloth mask that you're currently wearing. Do you understand those choices? I do, Your Honor. And do you um, choose to wear the white uh, cloth mask that you have been wearing throughout this trial? I do, Your Honor. All right. I also find that the defendant's constitutional rights, including but not limited to his right to confront his accusers, as well as due process, outweigh any authority by the county executive or the administrative judge regarding mandates on masks. And therefore, um, Mr. Ford's entitled to a fair trial and in order to um, provide his attorney's ability to confront his accusers, um, I find that uh, the wearing of masks by either the attorney or the a witness are an appropriate compromise as to that. And well, as that the victim or witness stand is more than six feet away from any other persons, as well as the fact that those of us in the well have all been vaccinated, including the defendant. Thank you. Mr. Riley. Your Honor, good morning again. May I please the court, Scott Riley and Joe Corbin on behalf of Stanley Ford. Uh, again, we will renew all prior motions, including but not limited to our motion for severance and our opposition to the joint in this matter. Additionally, Your Honor, I believe the first witness this morning is going to be Dr. Kohler from the Southern County Medical Examiner's Office. And again, we offered to stipulate the cause and manner of death for uh, all the victims at the 693 Fultz uh, Fire, Cameron Huggins, Olivia Huggins, Kyle Huggins, Deja Huggins, Jared Boggs, Angela Boggs, and Dennis Huggins. Uh, I think there is no need based on that stipulation that the jury uh, should then have to view pictures of uh, photographs of uh, these deceased children and their parents um, and whatever uh, uh, you know, the probative value of that is, is not outweighed by the extreme prejudicial effect uh, of the pictures of their children. It's outweighed. Yeah. The, the probative value is not outweighed by the extreme prejudicial effect. Yes. No. I think it's outweighed. You want it. You want to check out. I do. <laughs> short, short version. Uh, for your first motion regarding severance and that issue that you raise on every day based on Ohio law, 
is overruled based on my previous written opinion as to that issue. Uh, Mr. Leprinzi, would you like to respond to his motion regarding the pictures from Dr. Kohler and his offer to stipulate? Um, we reject the offer to stipulate, Judge, and obviously they've been telling us throughout this trial it's our burden, um, and we're accepting that burden. And um, I think the court has reviewed what we intend to um, show to this jury, and I think that even under Ohio Supreme Court standards, we're well below that. Um, in what we're showing in regards to this, we show one identifying photograph of each individual plus the scene photo where they were recovered, and that is pretty much it. We don't, you know, even in, in other homicide cases, we do more. Um, but because of the nature of this case, we recognize this. Because of the death penalty nature of this case, uh, although legally I don't think we are required to, we have held back many, many photographs. Um, that we probably believe uh, under Ohio Supreme Court law or case law would still come in. All right, All right. Um, the defense's objection is overruled. Uh, I do find, I did review um, the photos contained in Dr. Kohler's PowerPoint and any picture of any deceased victim, of course, would have some prejudicial effect. I mean, they're dead. So clearly that's going to have some prejudicial effect. It's whether or not the probative value outweighs that prejudicial effect and I based on based on Dr. Kohler's testimony and, and what's included in that PowerPoint. I find that um, the probative value outweighs the prejudicial effect and the motion's denied. All right, Cindy, I need you to take these and I need you to not cough. This is a really important testimony and I can't have okay. that I can't have that going on during the trial. That's all right. All right, ready? Yes. Anything else for the record? All right. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm just, just checking with co-counsel here because of the nature of this testimony. We were trying to get all the victims. We went to the back of the room. It was locked. So we're just making sure that everybody's warned ahead of time. I think we've done that. Okay. Bring them in. Yes, sir. Okay, Yeah, I, I, if I find it, I'll, I have the ability to shut the monitors down. Oh, look at that. Thank you. You may be seated. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. By a show of hands, once you're all, look, everyone's got their hand up already. I didn't even ask the question yet. Um, by a show of hands, um, please verify that you have complied with my admonition, have not talked to anybody about the case, or formed an opinion. I see 17 hands. Thank you very much. You may call your next witness. Thank you. Dr. Kohler, could you raise your right hand, please? Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. And you know the routine. Once you're seated, you can remove your mask and please keep your voice up. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning. Uh, welcome back. Thank you. Uh, for the record, since you've already introduced yourself previously, would you just state your full name and spell your last name again for the court reporter? Dr. Lisa Kohler, K-O-H-L-E-R. And Dr. Kohler, last time you were here, you told us that you are the chief medical examiner for Summit County? Yes, I am. And um, we went over your background, training, and experience. Yes, sir. Has anything changed since the last time we talked? No, it has not. All right. So let's move past all of that part of it. Um, and move directly into why you're here this, this morning. As a chief medical examiner, you told us last time that you had two other individuals, doctors, forensic um, uh, pathologists, who work in your office under your uh, supervision, correct? Yes, sir. All right. 
And in 2016, when um, um, the fire took place in that case, you actually did the autopsies. Yes, I was performing autopsies then as I do now. All right. And I'm talking about on that case that you testified previously um, of Lindell Lewis and Gloria Hart. Yes, sir. Okay. As a medical examiner, you don't do the autopsies of every person that comes through your office. Is that fair? That's true. And they can be performed by those other two pathologists. Yes, Forensic sir. pathologists, excuse me. Yes, sir. As far as your responsibilities in um, them performing the autopsy and ultimately, <coughs> and ultimately, <coughs> excuse me, um, taking responsibility for the results of that autopsy, do you have any uh, responsibility there? In having one of the other pathologists perform the autopsy, they are responsible for taking care of performing the autopsy and coming to conclusions about the case, but I review each of those reports and if there is a question about their findings or their conclusions, then we have a discussion about that and come to a, a consensus on that before I sign off on the reports. All right. And ultimately, you have to sign off on it for it before it becomes official. Is that fair? Yes, sir. And so you would have to, as you said, you review the, their, their work, you review their report, and do they come up with a cause and manner of death? Yes, sir, they do. And then do you have to agree with that in order for that to be official? Yes, sir. Okay. So let me direct your attention to the fire that took place on May 15, 2017 at 693 Fultz. Were you aware of that fire and the um, loss of life? Yes, I was. And who uh, did the autopsies of the victims in that case? Dr. George Sturbens. And tell us... Um, Dr. Sturbins, is he currently working with you? No, he is not. All right, and, and why is he not working there any longer? He left the office and found employment in Trumbull County. All right, and so um, he's still working as a forensic pathologist? Yes, sir. At the time, um, how long, if you remember, uh, had Dr. Sturbins been in your office? He had been there for many years. I don't recall how many. All right, is, was it? More than 10? Most likely, yes. Okay. So a significant period of time. Yes, sir. And you had, he, he was assigned with uh, performing these autopsies. Um, and then he, did he prepare an autopsy report? Yes, he did. And in that, um, in doing that, then did he then submit them to you for your review? Yes. And did you review them? I did. And did you ultimately sign off on them and agree with his findings? Yes, I did. Since that time, in preparation for your testimony, did you review again his, um, his activities in, re in performing these autopsies? Yes, I did. All right. And so you have reviewed them in preparation of testifying today as the chief medical examiner who supervised Dr. Sturbin's when these were done? That is correct. In doing, um, in doing that, um, I'm going to show you a series of exhibits. You may I approach, Judge? You may. I'm going to show you, first of all, what has been marked as State's Exhibit Number 141. If you would take a look at that and tell me if you recognize that.
Yes, State's Exhibit 141 is the report of investigation and the report of autopsy and the toxicology regarding the death of Cameron Benjamin Huggins. Okay. Showing you State's Exhibit 142 for identification purposes. Can you tell me if you recognize that? Yes, State's Exhibit 142 is the report of investigation, the report of autopsy and toxicology for Olivia Ruth Huggins. And is, um, and I forgot, did I ask you on this first one, 141, is, is that an accurate copy of the original? Yes, it is. And is 142 an accurate copy of the original of that one? Yes, it is. Showing you State's Exhibit number 143, do you recognize that? Yes, State's Exhibit 143 is the report of investigation, the report of autopsy and toxicology for Kyle Kenneth Huggins. And is that a fair and accurate copy of the original? Yes, it is. And State's, State's Exhibit number 144, do you recognize that? State's Exhibit 144 is the report of investigation, report of autopsy, and toxicology for Deja Marie Huggins. And is that a fair and accurate copy of the original? Yes, it is. And State's, State's Exhibit 145, do you recognize that? State's Exhibit 145 is the report of investigation, the autopsy, and toxicology report for Jared Michael Boggs. And is that an accurate copy of the original? Yes, it is. And State's Exhibit number 147, do you recognize that? Yes, State's Exhibit 147 is the investigation, autopsy, and toxicology reports for Angela Box. And is that an accurate copy of the original? It is. And State's Exhibit number 146, do you recognize that? State's Exhibit 146 is the investigation, autopsy, and toxicology for Dennis Lamont Huggins. And is this accurate, is, an accurate, is it an accurate copy of the original? It is. Thank you. <clears throat> Your Honor, at this point, um, in regards to State's Exhibit number 141 through 147, the seven autopsy reports, by agreement of the parties, the investigative portion of this will be pulled from that before or if it goes to a jury. All right. That's correct. And we'll review that then. Right. And we just want to make sure that it's clear that that will not, since it was testified about being here, that it will be removed before it would be admitted to as okay. an Thank you. Dr. Kohler. Um, 
in preparation for your testimony, you said you reviewed these all these um, autopsy reports and reports of investigation, toxicology reports, and did you then um, prepare a PowerPoint for purposes of presentation regarding cause and manner of death in this case? Yes, I did. All right. And at this point, I think I'll just kind of turn it over to you and let you kind of go through that. Let me uh, turn the screen on here. Let's have PowerPoint marks. Thank you. Okay. And I don't have a, a, a remote for you to change, so just let me know when you want the next slide. Now, and for purpose of the record and by agreement of counsel, you have in front of you a, a paper copy of this presentation. Is that fair? Yes, sir. And you will be referring to that um, during your presentation. Is that fair? Yes, sir. Okay. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Okay. The um, PowerPoint that I prepared here has information about both the Huggins and the Boggs family as indicated on slide one. And the incident occurred on May 15th of 2017 at 693 Fult Street. Next slide. The individuals who were found deceased in this fire are listed here. We have Cameron Huggins, a 16-month-old male, Olivia Huggins, a three-year-old female, Kyle Huggins, a five-year-old male, Deja Huggins, a six-year-old female, Jared Boggs, a 14-year-old male, and two adults, Angela Boggs, 38, and Dennis Huggins, 35. And the image in the corner of this is a photograph of the burned home. And that's at 693 Fultz? Yes, sir. When you perform an autopsy, do you confirm the identity and ages of the individual that the autopsy are being performed on? Yes, we confirm the identity and in um, Cases is particularly with young people. We'll we'll do additional examination to, to determine the age if possible. All right, and so in, in this case, the ages that you've given here for Cameron Huggins, Olivia Huggins, Kyle Huggins, DeAsia Huggins, um, those particularly uh, four individuals. Did you confirm their ages, um, or and how? These ages can be confirmed through dental records by looking to see the order in which the teeth are erupting and how many teeth are present can give you an age estimation. I don't recall the exact method that we use to confirm the ages on these individuals, but that is one of the methods available to us. All right, and in your report, um, and I don't know how um, I guess ultimately the fact that you have indicated the ages here, do you believe within a reasonable degree of, I guess, medical certainty or, or I guess, professional certainty in your field that these individuals, these four individuals, were all under the age of 13? Yes, Cameron, Olivia, Kyle, and Deja were all under 13. Okay, um, go ahead and please continue then. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, in this image, you can see the remains of multiple of the individuals present here. I have a, um, a full color image on the one side and then a, a dimmed out vision of the uh, remains with names on there. So you can see in the dimmed out version on the um, lower corner, you can see that Deja is upper on the uppermost corner followed by Dennis with Kyle, Angela and Cameron all visible there. Olivia who was three was found underneath the remains of Deja and Dennis and in the image that's in full color you can see some red ovals there and those are showing limbs of individuals that are partially covered by other individuals. Okay. And you had talked about um, an investigative report, and I think we talked about this previously too. You have an investigator that will go to the scene, and, and part of 
your job is to rely on the investigators to help you and assist you in coming up with your conclusions. That's correct. Next slide. This is an image of Jared Boggs in the fire. There's a firefighter next to him. You can see the, the one image is, is the full color where you can see the remains there and then the dimmed version, I've indicated what body parts are visible to you when you can see the torso, thigh, arm, and calf of Jared. And he was at the base of the steps just outside of the bedroom that we just saw previously where the remainder of the family members were. The common features for the individuals found in this fire is they all had elevated carboxyhemoglobin levels, which is a, the effect of carbon monoxide on the body, and they had burns to portions of their body. There is a rule of nines that is used to estimate what body surface area percentage is involved by the fire, and that is the image that you see there at the bottom in color, indicating that the head is 9%. Each arm is 9%, each leg is 18%, the front part of the trunk of the body is 18%, the back side of the front of the trunk of the body is 18%, with 1% for genitalia to give you a full 100%. So this is the type of diagram that we use to ascribe approximately what the body surface area is that's involved by burns. And now you when you said you use to ascribe that, um, this um, rule of nines, this is, is this industry wide in your field? Yes, this is just a medical rule of nines. So Children's Hospital is our local burn center. When they're evaluating victims of, of thermal injury or burns, they will use the same sort of diagram to determine what percentage of the body has thermal injuries. And so this is a commonly accepted manner of determining the percentage of a person's body that has been burned in your field of forensic pathology and medicine? Yes, sir. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay, now we're going to go through the individuals and discuss what their findings were and some of their location information. So first up is Cameron Huggins. This is our youngest victim who was 16 months old at the time of the fire. His carboxyhemoglobin was greater than 75%. He was found under Angela's legs and had thermal injury to more than 50% of the body surface area. Next. The next individual is Olivia Huggins. She is a three-year-old. Her carboxyhemoglobin was 63.9%. She was found under both Deja, the six-year-old, and Dennis, the 35-year-old, and she had thermal injury to greater than 20% of her body surface area. She was largely shielded from the fire by the um, bodies of Deja and Dennis. Next, please. Kyle Huggins is the five-year-old victim. His carboxyhemoglobin was 69.3%. He was found under Dennis's arm and had thermal injury to greater than 50% of his body surface area. Next. Deja Huggins is a six-year-old. She had a carboxyhemoglobin greater than 75%. She was found under the body of Dennis, the 35-year-old male, and had thermal injury to greater than 50% of her body surface area. Next. Jared Box is the 14-year-old child who was found out in the stairwell. His carboxyhemoglobin was greater than 75%, found in the steps outside of the bedroom where his other family members were found, and had a thermal injury of greater than 50% of his body surface area. Next. Angela Box is a 38-year-old adult. Her carboxyhemoglobin level was 66.8%. She was found lying with her legs over Cameron and had 30 thermal injuries um, of greater than 50% of her body surface area. Next. Dennis Huggins is a 35-year-old male. 
His carboxyhemoglobin was 68.5%, and he was found lying on Deja and Olivia, with thermal injury accounting for greater than 50% of his body surface area, and he had autopsy evidence of high blood pressure and coronary artery disease, which I described as hypertensive atherosclerotic heart disease in this slide. Next. This slide you saw previously when I testified before, again reiterating the disorientation in fires. The smoke can fill the room very rapidly and you very quickly get low to zero visibility due to the intense amount of smoke. And as the carbon monoxide builds in your body, then you become um, even more impaired. Your ability to judge and to act is impaired. Next. So this is just reminding you what carbon monoxide is. It's a colorless, odorless gas. And as you start breathing it in and it builds up in your body, you get a, a variety of symptoms that can happen, uh, which include confusion. And what happens when the carbon monoxide is breathed in, it binds much more strongly to the red blood cells that should be carrying oxygen to your tissues. So it's taking up all of the space for the oxygen and it stays on the red blood cell and keeps the red blood cell from releasing any um, oxygen or carbon monoxide off into the, the tissues because it's held so tightly. Next. This is just, again, the same slide I had before where we're describing how normal breathing occurs as air comes into the air sacs. The blood is going to come from the heart and oxygen is pulled from the air and carbon dioxide is dropped off into the air and then the oxygenated blood would then go to the tissues and give it the oxygen it needs to function. But with the carbon monoxide, it blocks the blood cell's ability to hold that oxygen and it also blocks its ability to release oxygen to the, to the body. So that causes problems. Next slide, please. And this just shows the levels of impairment that occurs when you have increasing levels of carbon monoxide. And I've circled the 30 to 60 to 70 percent because this is where we start getting the confusion and start having issues with um, ability to function. And at 60 to 70 percent, the person can die. And as we saw with all of these individuals, they had all reached that level of, of carbon monoxide. Elderly people can die at a lower level just because they don't have as much reserve as a healthy individual. And the brain and heart normally have high oxygen use, so they're very sensitive to the presence of carbon monoxide. Next slide, please. Before we go to the next slide, let me just ask a couple questions. Um, in doing these um, reports, you said that there was also a toxicology report for each of these victims. Yes, sir. Was there anything of note in any of the toxicology reports, um, I guess, for any of them? For Cameron, the only finding was a carbon monoxide. The same for Olivia. Kyle's only finding was carbon monoxide. Deja's only finding was carbon monoxide. Jared's only finding was carbon monoxide. Angela's only finding was carbon monoxide. And Dennis also was only carbon monoxide. So none of the individuals had any substances in their blood system that was detected aside from the carbon monoxide. All right, and that would include illicit drugs and alcohol? Correct. Thank you. <clears throat> Going to the next slide. Okay, the final slide here are the cause and manner of death for each of the individuals in the Huggins and Boggs family who died in the fire. The cause of death was smoke inhalation and carbon monoxide poisoning, and the manner was homicide. How injury occurred is house fire intentionally set by another person. All right. And of course, the house fire intentionally set by another person, that 
also would be something that would be somewhat outside of your uh, medical field, do you rely on law enforcement individuals in regards to that intentional setting of a house fire? Yes, we rely upon the result of the fire marshal's office or whoever is investigating the fire to provide us with what their assessment is on how that fire started and that does dictate how we rule on the manner of death. All right. And in regards to your job and profession, just so that we're clear, you are not tasked with determining who would have intentionally set that fire. Is that fair? That's correct. The one thing that um, stood out is in the one slide from Mr. Huggins, um, you indicated that there was some heart issues. Um, how do you separate that out in making your determination that he didn't die from a, a heart attack or some other heart condition versus smoke inhalation? In this situation, his carboxyhemoglobin was 68.5%, which is well within the lethal range. And so that is the reason for his death. The fact that it didn't get higher is likely due to the fact that he had some heart disease already. Dr. Kohler, um, all the um, opinions that you have given today um, in regards to these seven individuals, are they all within a reasonable degree of medical certainty? Yes, they are. Thank you. Your Honor, I have no further questions. Gentlemen? No questions. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Dr. Kohler. You're excused. Yes. So there's two witnesses that are going to be testifying by Ring Central. Um, they had scheduled that for 1030. We're going to take a short break till 10 to allow the state to contact them so that we can get that set up. And instead of waiting around, around till 1030, we're going to hopefully get them ready to go at 10. So again, remember the admonitions I've previously given you concerning your conduct. Do not discuss the case amongst yourselves or with anyone else, including family, friends, or the media. Do not read or post anything about this case on the internet or any um, electronic device, including your cell phone. Any such discussion, if discovered, could lead to a mistrial and severely compromise the party's right to a fair trial. Do not permit anyone to discuss it with you or in your presence, and do not form or express an opinion on this case until it's finally been submitted to you. Leave your notepads upside down on your seats, and we'll see you back at 10 o'clock. If we can't get them early, Ken will come in and let you know, okay? All right, please.